Welcome to Bird Ultrasound Case of the Week. This week we're going to take a look at an ankle syndesmosis injury. When an ankle has trauma, I always feel like it can fail in several different and quite predictable ways. The first thing that can happen, and the most common thing of course, is that the hind foot is separated from the tibia and the fibula. So the hind foot consists of the calcaneum and the talus, and so when we have an ankle inversion injury, which is the most common type, you'll see the anterior talofibular ligament that connects the fibula to the talus, and the calcaneofibular ligament, which connects the fibula to the calcaneum, becomes separated and damaged. And this is a, a classic inversion injury where the hind foot is separated from the tibia and fibula. The next type of injury is an injury which is known as a Chopart line failure. Now the Chopart line is between the hind foot and the midfoot. So the hind foot bones are the calcaneum and the talus, and the midfoot bones are the navicular, the cuboid, and the three cuneiforms. When we fail through this line, it's the dorsal talonavicular ligament that is damaged or broken, and also the calcaneocuboid or the bifurcate ligament uh, is also damaged, and this can also cause a fracture of the anterior tubercle of the calcaneum. The third way that the foot can fail is through the Liz Frank line, and this is where the forefoot is separated from the midfoot. However, Liz Frank line failures are really best imaged with a, a DP weight bearing radiograph, and if this is abnormal, then cross sectional imaging, and really ultrasound doesn't have a strong role to play in these injuries. And this brings us to the fourth type of pattern that we see, and this is a syndesmotic injury. And the case we have today is an example of a syndesmotic injury. And what happens with a syndesmosis injury is that the tibia and the fibula are separated from each other. So both anteriorly and posteriorly, we have an anterior tibiofibular syndesmosis and a posterior tibiofibular syndesmosis, which are distally placed and reinforce the, the bind of those two bones together and stop them separating. Of course, between those two bones, we also have an interosseous membrane. So when either the anterior or the posterior syndesmosis fails, then this interosseous membrane can also be damaged and torn. And this is a very neurally rich structure, which means that when it tears, it's very, very painful. And typically patients with a syndesmosis injury will not present walking into the department. They'll come in in a wheelchair, a moon boot, or on crutches, because it's very, very painful to walk with a syndesmosis injury. So this is the patient that we have and he's a, a, a young gentleman and he's been playing soccer and someone has trod on his foot when he was trying to be tackled and the foot has undergone some unusual vector of force type injury. He came in on crutches and in all sorts of pain and there was a significant amount of swelling around the anterior ankle joint. I really expected when I put the transducer on the skin to, be, to see a torn anterior talofibular ligament. However, this is the image that I saw when I started the scan. And of course, his anterior talofibular ligament is perfectly normal. This little bit of fluid underneath the ATFL is physiological. We see this all the time. And there wasn't a particularly large amount of swelling in the soft tissues here to suggest that the ATFL was torn. When the ATFL tears, of course, the synovial fluid from the ankle joint leaks out through the tear, and the ATFL is simply part of the joint capsule. This fluid then ends up in the subcutaneous space here, in amongst the fat, interstitially, and causes that edema that we expect to see, and sometimes it causes that cobblestone type edema pattern. Following this, I went and had a look at his calcaneofibular ligament, and to do this, I lay the patient prone. I feel like when I scan the patient prone, the CFL is much better visualised, and I think it's just the gravitational effect of the uh, of the talus and the calcaneum dropping down towards the floor slightly, and it just really helps straighten out and lengthen the uh, the calcaneofibular ligament. So you can see here's the peroneus longus and brevis tendon sitting above, and then this is the calcaneal uh, insertion of the CFL. This is the fibular origin here, and you can see how nicely this CFL is intact. So what we have now is we have a patient that is come in on crutches, has had trauma to the ankle, and has a normal anterior talofibular ligament and a normal calcaneofibular ligament, which was quite a surprise to me. So I thought at this point that maybe I'm going to see a Chopart line failure. This is where I was heading and thought maybe this is what we're going to find. Because with a Chopart line failure, you can certainly have preservation of these two ligaments, but then when you get to the talonavicular and the calcaneocuboid ligament, you'll see the pathology. So in this video here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to slide between the ATFL, so this is the anterior 
talofibular ligament. And I'm going to slide the transducer up towards the anterior inferior tibiofibular syndesmosis. So we start here at the ATFL and now we slide, rotate the transducer around. So I'm keeping the fibular end of the transducer stationary and I'm moving the other end around, leaving the talus and arriving at the tibia. And what we see here is quite a dramatic appearance. So what we see is a normal ATFL. We maintain the fibula. We slide this end of the probe more proximally. We lose the talus, we come into the tibia, and you can see this echogenic area here. And this echogenic area here is a periosteal stripping, where it's a part of the fibula that's been stripped away. And this is the tibia over here, and you can see how disorganized this anterior inferior tibiofibular syndesmosis is. So what we have now is we have really good evidence that we have a syndesmotic injury, and that's why this patient is in so much pain and can't wait bear. So the ATFL is normal, the CFL is normal, uh, the show part line is normal, but we have a what is known as a high ankle sprain or a tear of the anterior inferior tibiofibular syndesmosis. You can then do a stress test on the AITFS, and the way I do the stress test is to bend the patient's knee and to put my hand underneath the hind foot. So I'm cupping the uh, calcaneum and the talus with my, my hand, and I place the transducer in an orientation lined up exactly where this frozen image is, which is between the the fibula on this side and the tibia on this side, and the angle of the transducer is nowhere near axial. The fibula end of the transducer is more distally orientated, and the tibial end of the transducer is more proximal. So you're angling up towards the opposite knee, if you like, or the opposite proximal calf of the other leg. And when you get this orientation correct, you bend the knee, you put your hand underneath the calcaneum, and then you do an external rotation of the hind foot. This stresses the anterior inferior tibiofibular syndesmosis. And as we do the stress test, we'll be scanning through here, you can see how much disruption there is of the AITFS. And then with the stress test, you'll see that uh, there's also significant laxity. So here we go with the stress, and we're applying the external rotation now. And you can see the way that the tibia just walks away from the fibula there. And you can see the way that the whole AITFS apparatus is quite mushy and soft, so it really is not supporting articulation between the two bones. I'll just play that video again so that you can see the uh, laxity and the... Uh, the movement of these two bones relative to each other. In a normal individual, the anterior inferior tibiofibular syndesmosis is very tight and very strong, so you should not have any movement whatsoever. The next question is, can we see the posterior inferior tibiofibular syndesmosis? And if you asked me a couple of years ago, I would have said, no, it's not really a role for ultrasound. If you see an AITFS that's injured, then we don't worry about looking at the PITFS, we just send them off for cross-sectional imaging. However, with the assistance of Andrew Grant uh, and a bit of education from him, I now have a really nice technique for the posterior inferior tibiofibular syndesmosis. And it's as simple as doing a mirror image of the anterior component. So in other words, you line your transducer up. I, I place my transducer just lateral to the Achilles tendon. Uh, I place one end of my transducer on the fibula, and then I line the other end of the transducer up, again, pointing proximally up towards about the proximal calf of the other leg. So in other words, the tibial end of the transducer is a lot more proximal than the fibula end. And when I place the transducer in this orientation, you can see really nicely here, the PITFS. And in fact, when we do an internal rotation, which I'm doing now, you can see it tightens. And when I go back to neutral, it slackens out again. So you can see really nicely in this individual that the posterior inferior tibiofibular syndesmosis is in fact intact. Now when you see this syndesmosis that has been ruptured, you again you'll see a separation of these two bones relative to each other, and of course you might also see an avulsion fracture from the fibula or the tibia at this location. So the stress test for this is the opposite. So I do an external rotation of the hind foot for the AITFS, and then I do a, an internal rotation for the PITFS. So it's interesting that they both require quite a different type of stress manoeuvre. The next thing this brings me to is, is consideration of the interosseous membrane. It's something that I've never had much interest in. But because of uh, Son Nguyen from uh, Loomis Imaging in Adelaide sharing some cases uh, through the forum with me, I have a really renewed interest in this interosseous membrane. So this is an, uh, two cases I'm going to share with you of interosseous membrane injuries. So what we're doing now is you 
if you can do the AITFS image, so you've got that nice orientation of the transducer, and then you just walk the transducer up towards the knee, it, keeping that same orientation, you get this very nice image where you can see the fibula and the tibia. You've got the dorsalis pedis and, of course, the deep perineal nerve sitting on the interosseous membrane. Immediately behind it here, this is the tibialis posterior muscle belly, and this interosseous membrane here you can see has a separation in it. So this individual has an AITFS injury, and they also have gone on to tear the interosseous membrane and in the long axis, you can see the membrane is, is very strong here and here, but it is sort of ghosting through here, and you can see the hematoma that is formed both anterior and posterior to the interosseous membrane, and that correlates to this hematoma that we're seeing here on the short axis image. So this is another beautiful split screen example here where we've got an intact interosseous membrane with dorsalis pedis and then on the symptomatic side you can see that the interosseous mem membrane stops here, we have a rupture of it and we have a hematoma forming in this location. When we put the uh, long axis and the Doppler on, the, the Doppler doesn't really give us any additional information, but as we scan through there, you can see the way that the interosseous, interosseous membrane is very healthy and strong, and then as we scan through, you can see that it's deficient. This is another patient that has had uh, another type of injury, and in fact, this patient had a fracture. And what we can see here, again, is that the interosseous membrane on the asymptomatic side is nice and intact, and on the symptomatic side, you simply can't see the interosseous membrane. So these cases that Son Nguyen has uh, shared with me have really reinforced uh, me to think that I need to look at the interosseous membrane in a more detailed way. So what I do now is whenever I have a patient that has a AITFS high ankle sprain injury, I go then and look at the PITFS and then I come up and I also look at the interosseous membrane to complete that examination. And I feel like the combination of these sonographic techniques provides a more comprehensive assessment of these high ankle sprain injuries. I hope you've enjoyed this short presentation. I hope now that you're thinking along the lines of hind foot separating from tib fib, from hind foot separating from mid foot, which is, uh, which is the Chopart line failure, and then of course, Liz Frank injuries, and, and because of this presentation, the high ankle sprain, where we're looking at both, not just the anterior, but also the posterior syndesmotic apparatus, and then extending the examination on to look at the interosseous membrane to get a really comprehensive assessment of these high ankle sprains that are so debilitating for the patient. Happy scanning and bye for now. If you've enjoyed this presentation, please visit birdultrasound.com.au or email me at stayintouch at birdultrasound.com.au. If you visit birdultrasound.com.au, you'll see a large variety of educational material on all sorts of ultrasound topics. Please take a visit and enjoy the material. Happy scanning and bye for now.